Gold is one of the earliest known metals humans have mined and used, with its oldest use dated to around 40,000 years ago during the Paleolithic period. It has been collected for its metallic luster and rarity and even became currency for commerce. As an element, its particles can find themselves in any manner of places. Just like iron pyrite, copper, calcite, silica, and phosphates, they become deposited from liquids after they become too heavy or concentrated for the liquid to hold. What were to happen if a liquid with a high enough concentration of gold particles inundated a left-behind piece of organic material? Maybe even a bone? Any piece of organic material left over from a living thing – plants, bones, cartilage, scales, feathers, or shells – can become a fossil. The original possessor of the organic material must first die to become preserved via various means. I'm going to use a bone for my example. The most common process in which a fossil is formed is called permineralization. In this process, a bone becomes buried by sediments laid down from the movement of water or wind. The bone becomes covered by the sediments and thus protected from being messed with by any other animals or the process of decay from microscopic bacteria. Water, saturated with minerals dissolved out of surrounding rocks, flood the sediment-covered bone over many years. That water evaporates and leaves behind the mineral payload it was carrying. The original bone erodes and the minerals left behind replace the bone in the exact same shape, creating a mineral replica of the original material, which may then fall under the replacement process of fossilization. That is simply one way in which a fossil can be made, but since this video isn't about the many processes of fossilization, I'll leave it at that. Be sure to keep an eye out on the channel as I will be delving into these processes relatively soon. Since rocks in any environment which promotes fossilization can be a substantial sum of varying elements and combinations therein, any number of cool materials can be brought into the bone. There are quartz, opal, and iron pyrite fossils. Any fossil principally made of one particular mineral can also hold within it a bounty of other elements and minerals in itty bitty concentrations. It's really neat to find a fossil made of iron pyrite since it appears like a dirty gold. Thus, its alter ego fools gold. But is it possible for us to take this line of thinking further? Is it possible for a fossil to be made of gold, whether pure or mostly so? The answer is a little more complicated than a simple yes or no, but before we get to that answer, I want to bring to your attention a somewhat anecdotal tale of a unique fossil find which implicated this whole query in the first place. The story of Genevieve, the Golden Dinosaur. Colorado has been a source of gold for a century and a half, and is partly why the state became a state to begin with. The London Mining Company had a setup of mines in central Colorado, in an area called Alma. While digging for gold, the miners had made a discovery which would shake the scientific world if it was found today. Unfortunately for the supposed fossil find, the discoverers must not have seen it as much more than a curiosity, as they decided to use its skull as a prop for their 1930s work lanterns. Once someone with knowledge of dinosaurs took a look under better lighting, they decided to try their mitts at extracting the find from the rock's embrace. Preservation was not on their minds. An unknown tonnage of dynamite later, and the fossil had been successfully detached from the mine itself and removed. Since they used dynamite, the fossil was blown to pieces and scattered. The workers, led by the discoverer of the fossil, William White, hoisted all of the shattered remains of the primordial creature out of the mine and set it on its way to Colorado College in Colorado Springs. William Jewett was an astute businessman, vice president of the Colorado Springs National Bank, owner of the Suburban Land and Water Company and the Colorado Springs Golf Club, and just so happened to also be the owner of the London Mines. Jewett called up Robert Landon, a Colorado College professor of geology, to take a look at their find to get a better idea of what it was and where it could be housed. The remains of what appeared to the miners as a large fossil creature were placed on the back of a truck and taken on their merry way to Colorado College. No doubts, steps were not taken to make sure the fossil got there intact. 
Dubbed Genevieve, the fossil measured 5.4 meters, 18 feet long, and 2 meters, 6 feet tall, and weighed a reportedly whopping 16 tons. The remains, now in the dark, depressing, dungeon-like basement of Colorado College, were pieced back together, bit by bit, with help from the lovely sludge known as cement. The find, once Humpty dumpty back together again, was set out for display at the Colorado College Natural History Museum, a display of which a photograph does not exist. What was it the college geologist cemented together? I don't know, I really have no clue, and neither does anyone else. There exists exactly one photograph of the fossil. The rest of Genevieve's story becomes an ever-intriguing, yet disappointingly short and vague journey of a real mystery. But what we do know is, if it was what the newspapers and discoverers say it was, then Genevieve was the rarest and most important geological and paleontological find of the century. A fossilized dinosaur made entirely of gold. That's right, you heard me, a fossil composed of gold. This is technically chemically possible, as the gold elements could have seeped their way into the bones of the animal when it died. However, it would be impossible for the remains to be pure gold. Gold is incredibly soft and can be cut like butter or wrapped like soft tinfoil. The characteristics of gold do not lend itself to fossil composition very well. Trapped under tons and tons of rock for millions of years would have flattened a pure gold fossil specimen into a thin veneer of metallic foil. Let's get one thing straight, no one is certain the remains belong to a dinosaur to begin with. The newspaper article describing the find and the steps taken to nurse the blasted pieces back into shape describe it as a rhynchocephalian reptile. The rhynchocephalians were a very large group of reptiles, distantly related to the lizards and snakes. All members of this group are extinct except for the adorable New Zealand endemic Tuatara. This group was widespread throughout the world and notable for the large incisor-like teeth hanging down from the upper jaw. Nothing about the find suggests it belongs with this identity. I'd like to point out at this time that the article published in the Colorado College Tiger newspaper stated that Genevieve was estimated to be anywhere from 18 million to 6 million years old, which was considered by the author to be somewhere around the Triassic period. As cute as that may seem, times as young as these really weren't assumed correct at this time. Radiometric dating methods using the half-life of radioactive materials was published on in 1907, and thus should have been known about at this time. Whatever it was, its age is unknown now and probably was neither Triassic nor tens of millions of years. Not a dinosaur, and not a rhynchocephalian reptile. What other explanations were given to this thing? Mr. Jesse Figgins was made aware of the discovery as per another article on the find in the Greeley newspaper, Colorado's Tribune Republican. Figgins regards Genevieve as a marine reptile but gives no other clues to her identity. The marine reptile idea would come up again when Professor of Geology Bill Fisher was pressed about the mystery back in 2004. In his response, he states that as far as anyone was aware, he was the last person to know of people who knew of the discovery since everyone else had died. Fisher personally had never heard of the find in his 50 years at Colorado College and thus was skeptical of its existence at all. As far as Fisher knew, the find was never put on a pedestal for display at the museum. Another hiccup in the authenticity of the specimen as a fossil or as a gold specimen betrays itself in the time it would take to clean up the find. Fossils are never heavily cleaned and prepared on site. They are wrapped in the most protective materials on hand and taken off site to a facility in which it can be carefully attended to and prepared for study. With the 16 tons of fossil and rock matrix purported by all accounts of the discovery, it would have taken many years to completely remove the earthen cocoon. Articles suggesting a display in the museum, as well as the details of the cementation of the pieces, all give a rough estimate of the fossil being back to new in only a year. Not possible. From the very poor quality photograph that exists of Genevieve, Fisher thought it may have been a phytosaur, a group of aquatic crocodile-mimicking archosaurs from the Triassic period which could get as long as killer whales. I think that might have been his direction because of the Triassic date given to the find, but as I went over before, details on that are super sketchy so I wouldn't even give it that much credence. 
Enough discourse from the experts, let's take a closer look at the photograph of the fossil and look for ourselves if we can surmise anything about its anatomy. The only part of the specimen that I can make out as fossil bone is near the front, which I'm assuming is the neck of the creature. If that is the neck, then that is the body, these are the legs, and the oddly well-curved thing here is the tail. Now, if the specimen is a fossil and is still encased and or bordered by rock matrix, then it is possible the fossil bones are simply not visible in such a low quality and poorly lit photo. The whole specimen, save for the head and neck region, look very blobby and without definable form. In fact, to me, the whole thing looks like a caricature of the Loch Ness Monster. If this is truly a fossil specimen made of gold, then it would kind of make sense that the whole thing got squished into the blobby formless mass you see in the picture. But as I went over before, it's kinda impossible to get a gold fossil anyway. I took another run through of the article, and one statement piqued my interest. It reads, She has only two legs, as she is full of gold ore, and the miners have probably shipped the rest of her to the smelter. This is intriguing to me because it may indicate the specimen had four legs in its initial state. If so, then the specimen would have been nearly complete with all four legs, body tail and neck and head. Another aspect to fossils that just doesn't happen, you never find a complete specimen. Some big red flags are starting to freak me out about this find. Too many characteristics point towards a hoaxy or non-truthful origin. Either the entire thing was fabricated as a story to drum up interest in readerships, or the find was made out of iron pyrite and the specimen eventually disintegrated into dust, as iron pyrite does when kept in an environment without climate control. Or the find was real, but had streaks of gold, which formed on top of the fossil after its initial formation, with some of it going to the smelters before recovery at the museum and the rest of Genevieve meeting its end to a smelter or smuggler within the last half century. Either way, Genevieve the Golden Dinosaur's case has run cold. The museum it called home has since been closed down. All those associated with the find are dead. Though the real story of what Genevieve was will forever remain a mystery, this video brings together everything known about her. There are still a few miners who, while relaxing at a local saloon, fondly ponder the puzzle of Genevieve. They raise their shot glasses and make this toast to the miners who found the golden dinosaur. May you always stand on ore and your labors be in vain. A very special thanks goes to geologist Stephen Wade Veach, as he was the one to bring this story to my attention via his blog, Colorado Earth Science. He is the progenitor of many projects and has been involved with the Colorado Springs Pebble Pups and Earth Science Scholars Program for many years and has helped me get more confident in my abilities in the field of paleontology and geology, as well as opened many new doors to me. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, hit the bell icon for updates, like this video, and drop a comment in the comment section below. Thanks for watching. Special thanks to my elephant tier patrons Arda Bayer, Biotiverse, Christoph Hubbinger, Dinosaur, Isaiah Garza, PA Brew News, Ray, Rudy Redgrave, Smiling Walrus. And another thanks to my Tyrannosaurus tier patrons, Iberospinus, Iron Bladesman, Swaffles is Weird, Teeny Dragator, The Dogman, 